as we look toward the next 24 hours, we cannot pinpoint as a greater threat for one area versus another. It could be Collier, it could be Lee, could be Charlotte, could be Tampa Bay. in effect for all of Southwest Florida. Very strong thunderstorms. We are also seeing a pickup in the breeze in just the last hour or so. We have a serious situation. This is the beginning of the hurricane, folks. Wow, I now actually, they're on the hotel. August 13th, 2004. We went ahead south now to Fort Myers Beach. That is where we find Sean Brown. We are really starting to see the signs that Hurricane Charlie is approaching southwest Florida down here on the south side of there. A morning of heightened anticipation. We're going to just remove all the canvas off this boat. People at the ready. I'm uh, boarding up my windows uh, for the uh, storm coming in. But not ready for this. This is the track that the National Hurricane Center the storm is taking. What we're telling you right now is this is the track we are seeing on our live radar. Take a look out there. You can see the skies are darkening out here. We can barely see Sanibel. Even though the National Hurricane Center has not declared this a major hurricane. This is, in fact, our major hurricane. The winds have just picked up severely to the point where I can barely hear you. Late word from a Hurricane Hunter plane just a few minutes ago. They have monitored and measured winds of 140 miles an hour in the eye wall of this dangerous hurricane. People have been urged to evacuate this area, also including the historic district of Punta Gorda. Get out right now. This is the real McCoy now. This is the major hurricane. This is the one that's heading for Southwest Florida. The winds are just howling. I can't even describe how hard the winds are blowing. You can see the eye of Hurricane Charlie now, a Category 4 major hurricane with 145 mile per hour winds is getting dangerously close to the Lee Island coast. The water is just absolutely amazing. It's coming over everything. See, the waves continue to crash over here. Some of the markers we were pointing out earlier have totally disappeared. They're totally under the water. You need to take protective measures now to protect your life and the life of your loved ones. Gather everybody up, get them in there. The last thing we heard Jim Reed say was Charlotte County hunker down. down. And the power went out. Holy sh this window's bending. Rain is falling viciously at the airport. Wow, what a what a uh, an amazing sight there! Uh, live images of uh, Southwest Florida International Airport and the weather conditions there. Guys, you are looking at live pictures outside the fifth floor of the resort, Mid Island, Estero Island, Fort Myers Beach. You can see we are still getting pelted and pounded here. The storm surge just incredible right now. We're talking two or three feet. This island is basically a city. Water. Boats that are in the canals out here are now as high as the homes because the water is just rising up out of the canals. Let me go ahead and show you how powerful the wind is here. This is our window. You can see my hand vibrating as the wind just pounds the window. Here at the Cape Cod Fire Station number five, and one of their large aluminum doors has just buckled and blown in, and now parts of the ceiling are falling down in the, the main section of the fire rescue building where, where the emergency trucks are. Daisy, look at those big trees. How much they bend. I still feel here. This is so Back to Fort Myers Beach. Now you can see the uh, the uh, pier running out there, the dock that is. Uh, Jim, yep. that's a pretty. I, I really not more than an hour ago we had uh, 200 yards of beach Absolutely. out there visible. Absolutely, that's amazing. Charlie is going to pass directly over downtown Punta Gorda. Yes, it does look that and, way. And uh, Todd Jakowski, tell us what's going on right now. 
Okay, right now we're seeing the winds. Uh, trees are being blown over. I can't even imagine, even estimate the type of winds. I've never seen anything actually uh, even this amount. But uh, the building, the, sh the awnings and the roof and the, the blinds and the windows are literally, they're just being peeled off like it's a, a paper tree or something along that lines. I don't know how else to describe it. There are people, uh, we're actually, we're seeing a tree, a huge tree right now, about a 15 foot tree being picked up right out of the ground. It feels like a live truck is actually being picked up. I don't believe that that's the case, obviously, but it certainly feels like that. And uh, obviously a very, very heavy rain is coming down. It looks like it's actually going upwards. It's uh, basically blowing straight across into the truck and into the, into the Charlotte Harbor again, east to west. Actually more a, a northwesterly wind right now. We're looking now at a live picture from Charlotte Harbor. Uh, Jim, uh, yeah. what do you see about the conditions here? Uh, things are not looking very good right now. Now we're back to Fort Myers Beach. Oh, wow, look at that. Our cameras capture violent scenes on Fort Myers Beach and in Punta Gorda. Families riding out the storm do the same. Look, look. My treehouse is going. In Boquilla, the eye of the storm crosses. And he doesn't like wind either. Amateur videographer John Schneider captures the family's horse blown across the pasture. Oh man, he's blowing all over the place. In Charlotte County, That's pretty bad, man. I think NBC2 photojournalist Howie Grace watches a house across the canal disappear in sheeting rain. Trees strain against the wind as water starts coming in. Hurricane Charlie is an equal opportunity destroyer. From million dollar homes to mobile homes, new construction to historic buildings, it leaves no Southwest Florida County untouched. Good afternoon, everybody, uh, on a day that's certainly to go down in history in Southwest Florida, Friday the 13th. A couple of homes out here completely turned over on their side. Now they were buckled down, we're told, but the power of Charlie changed that. That's really scary. Taken into the main lobby of the airport. Every building, in fact, has been destroyed. Every plane has been destroyed. The red X means condemned. X, 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 X. No discretion on Charlie's part. No matter what size home or what size dock you can see here, uh, no mercy was spared on these homes and, and boats in the Hideaway Harbor area of uh, Boquilla. We lost all three hospitals. Uh, they've all been shut down. Uh, they could not function. Uh, all of them had significant structural damage. It was, um, it was a scary experience. It was, um, it was surreal. Uh, the wind was incredible. 
Those are pictures for those of you uh, with television sets oh, of Santa County and Arcadia there. That's just tragic to mm. see. The Turner Center uh, in DeSoto County was being used as a right. shelter. It was just as if the bomb were dropping. Th that's how it felt. And I thought, well, if I'm alive tomorrow morning, I'm alive tomorrow morning, that's all there is to it. It takes just six hours for the storm to move from Fort Myers Beach through Sanibel Island, Captiva, Upper Captiva, Yusepa, Pine Island, Charlotte Harbor, and DeSoto County. We have now seen the worst of the storm pass by. But in those six hours, Charlie alters the landscape of Southwest Florida. That is the pass that was created when Hurricane Charlie tore through Upper Captiva. That was one island yesterday. It is two islands today. Causing billions of dollars in damages. You could tell that home right there a total loss, it has to be. Killing six people in Southwest Florida. We're getting reports of our first fatality because of Hurricane Charlie. And leaving tens of thousands homeless. Look inside, you can see the shelves tossed over. It looks like you can kind of see someone's desk, maybe a sofa and a lamp. It's just, you're Stereo looking at like the inside. Mm -hmm. to, to explain it best, it almost looks like a, a kid's dollhouse. Mm -hmm. that just kind of shook it up and all the furniture's moved around. But even with the devastation, the shock, the utter helplessness, something emerges. This is a really proud town though, and we love it a lot, and I know we're gonna bring it back. You know, in Miami, 15 years later, you can go down there and still see where Andrew went through. And we aren't gonna stand for that on Pine Island. We're gonna take Pine Island, we're gonna get all the debris up, And two years from now, when you come to Pine Island, you aren't going to be able to see that a hurricane went through. It looks like Charlotte County was ground zero on this hit, so we're getting resources moving in. The cavalry is going to come to Charlotte County very, very quickly. Florida State, the federal government, they will already be in southwest Florida tomorrow. You watch, you'll see. 5,000 National Guardsmen have been mobilized. I promise you that everything all of the available resources of the federal government are going to be available to help in any way we can. You and me, come on. I am so looking forward to something cold to drink. We have restored power to 761,000 customers affected by this storm. We're doing everything humanly, and I emphasize the word humanly possible, to meet the needs of these residents. And it's going to continue, and it's going to get better and better day by day. We need all the help we can get. We've got 100 loads up in North Carolina waiting to get picked up. I didn't think it was possible to have this much damage. We've got $2 million that are been approved and checks handed out to people and individual assistance. We brought in ice, water, food. I'm not here to help people because I know our house is fine, but other people, my friend Dylan's mom came and she was crying and uh, I gave her a hug because her house was gone. I told her it was all right and she, she got some stuff and she went home. Thank God, God for these guys. Thank yeah, God. They've got, they, they're doing a great job. God bless you, man. Thanks right. a lot. How's that taste? Hard to beat. <laughs> That's your first drink in how long? Three days. And I want to tell you, the sun will shine again. You will come back, you will come back stronger and better. From our wall-to-wall -wall coverage and home videos. Trees are breaking apart, this is terrible. Shot by families riding it out. Look over there at that mango tree. I can't come through your window. The house is shaking. NBC2 reports. Five years after Hurricane Charlie.
August 13th, 2004, 4.29 p.m. When someone mentions Hurricane Charlie, the first picture that comes to my mind is the radar picture of that Category 4 hurricane at the mouth of Charlotte Harbor, aiming for Port Charlotte and Punta Gorda. Boy, this is rapidly deteriorating in Charlotte Harbor. You can see the, uh, the spray, uh, the water being ripped off the top. You see a little wisp of air, and I said to everyone, go downstairs and get into the bathroom because it's coming. I'm Marilyn Gabriel, and I rode out Hurricane Charlie in Deep Creek, Florida. My daughter and I were holding onto the front door, and the roof, it was daylight and darkness, and then daylight again, and the roof was gone. At all times, I had constant cell phone contact with my sister in Boynton Beach, and she wouldn't hang up. She kept saying, I think this is the last time I've, I'm ever going to speak with you. I won't hang up. Huddled with her family, Marilyn felt her home being torn apart around her. It wasn't until later she fully realized the wrath of Charlie. We came back out the next day, and the, there were police and everything on King's Highway. You had to show that you lived in this area in order to get in. And uh, that's when I think total shock set in, when I opened up the door of the house and realized that there was really basically nothing that we could save. Chief Meteorologist Jim Reef is here with some pretty distressing and sort of heartbreaking news out really of uh, Charlotte County. Uh, we had our first contact with our good friend Wayne Saladay, the uh, head of emergency management in Charlotte County. Uh, he uh, reports a very, uh, very bad situation up in Charlotte County right now. Essentially, the core of Port Charlotte is gone, he tells us. Uh, there are also literally hundreds, if not thousands, of people homeless in the Port Charlotte area tonight, and no place to put them. There is no large enough structure to house that many people. That was a nightmare. I still get goosebumps thinking, and then you got to deal with the waters, the molds. Where are we going to stay? Who are we going to stay with? How are we going to get there? The roads were, I mean, it was this downhill battle. Steve Parisi and his wife Sandy lost their Port Charlotte home. So we hid underneath a mattress and I actually hid under the mattress and grabbed my wife's legs and said, if something's going to happen, I'm going to be with her. Look at the last two frames here. It's, uh, it's obviously now made a move back over toward the, uh, the north and the east. It looks like the eye. There it is, back out now. After living in four different places, they moved into FEMA City. More than 500 temporary homes sitting on 120 acres. FEMA Park was, it was a blessing for a place to live. But it was no place you wanted to live. It got worse. FEMA Park got to be where it was a drug, drug haven. Oh, a, a, it was terrible. At one point, nearly 4,000 people lived there. It got a little bit difficult to deal with. Director of Hurricane Recovery, Bob Hebert, quickly noticed issues with FEMA City. Because of federal confidentiality issues, when FEMA put in the trailer park, uh, outside agencies were not allowed in unless they were invited in. Social workers, case workers, even housing placement agencies couldn't help those living in FEMA City. And they were going through a lot of emotional and, and uh, financial and physical issues out here, and we couldn't get to them. FEMA City was a concrete jungle. No green space, no gathering spots, no support system. You're looking at the you know, points to, while they were living out here, the price of gas was over $3 a gallon, and you have a family that, that can't afford to, to pay rent and can't afford to eat, and three o'clock in the morning they run out of diapers or formula for their baby, and they got a 10 mile drive to go get this stuff. Um, if that had been made available on site, that would made it easier for them. The county says it will do things differently next time. It will try to place the mobile homes near where victims live and make parks smaller. You would not have any units that were more than 20 to 30 trailers in them, mobile homes in them. They would not be located this far from town, from any town and, and services. And FEMA's listening. We just realized that that was probably just a little too big. Due in part to what the agency learned from Charlie, FEMA put fewer trailers in more group sites after Hurricane Katrina devastated Mississippi. But the biggest lesson for FEMA after Charlie? It's not a one organization show. It's a team effort from federal all the way down to local government. 
And if we go in as a team, we'll succeed as a team. Coming up. What we see so far, certainly there is damage. A group that learned the lesson the hard way. This, this is ridiculous. We don't want to stay. We want to see our property. We don't want to stay. We're not going to see our property. We just want to know what we got left. The leaders of Fort Myers Beach. We ain't seen our house in five days. We are talking about our worst case scenario, and we're seeing it this August 13th, 2004, just before 3 o'clock in the afternoon. As Fort Myers Beach residents watched, a six to seven foot storm surge washed over Estero Boulevard. The return of onshore winds now bringing a, a wall of water onto the beach. Wiping out power, sewer, and water, making Estero Island uninhabitable. We can't let people on the island until we can get that sewage out. We ain't seen our house in five days. Come on, what's the deal now? The tempers flared as sheriff's deputies and National Guardsmen blocked the Matanzas Pass Bridge. I feel so uh, empty. I want to scream. I want to. I want to choke somebody. This is where we got to stay till we get over the bridge. Five days after the hurricane hit. They have just opened the Matanzas Bridge here at Fort Myers Beach. The all clear was given and Checkpoint Charlie opened. We got water in the door now for sure. There we go. Uh, you guys will follow you in. This is worse than we expected. There was no way to get back on the island at all, which was frustrating. So we just had to wait. My name is Larry Kiker. I'm the mayor of Fort Myers Beach. We're standing out in the hallway right now. This is the closed door of this meeting. Now, earlier the door was open and we had a microphone in there, but we were told to leave. I don't think anybody was trying to hide anything here at all. I think that they just they didn't, perhaps didn't use the media uh, adequately to, to get the news out. That won't happen again. Uh, it's town hall on wheels. The town spent $82,000 on this mobile command center. In the event of a threat, computers and emergency systems will be loaded onto it so leaders can better communicate with island residents. We'll probably pull it down someplace convenient, like at the bottom of the bridge, like what happened during Charlie, and, and explain to people and communicate with people what's going on in their island, try to help them with their homes and with their personal situations. Fort Myers Beach isn't the only municipality to have a new command center. Since Charlie, new emergency operations centers opened in Collier, Charlotte, and DeSoto counties. Inside, debris is strewn about, and outside, the place is pretty much in a shambles. Once again, it's the Turner Center in DeSoto County. The sign says it all. Welcome to Arcadia. This is their water tower, completely collapsed during Hurricane Charlie, as you can tell, just a mess of tangled metal right now. No one in DeSoto County anticipated the strength of Hurricane Charlie as it barreled up US-17 into Arcadia. It was almost timeless. It took less than an hour for the worst to pass over Doug and Roberta Mann's DeSoto home. People say it's like a train, but we never even heard that. It was just white noise. It was just such a din. It just basically blanked out all audio. That din so loud, they never heard the roof being ripped off of their home. That would have been a distinct sound you think a mm -hmm. ripping of yeah. you know lumber and all of the braces and everything that that held a roof down and the, you know it, it did not stand out as a distinct sound at six all. to ten thousand pounds of a roof flying over like the wizard of oz and landing on the wicked witch of the west mm -hmm. you would have noticed you would think during a break in the storm doug and roberta ran from their home seeking shelter our natural thought <laughs> was to the Turner Center, which was designated the, um, you know, the, the hurricane place to go. Haven. Haven. Yeah, yeah. Craig, can we interrupt for a second? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're, we're, ha there's a, we're hearing a serious problem. One of the uh, major shelters in Arcadia right now uh, is, is losing its roof, and we understand there are 1,200 people in that shelter right now. When we got there, they were evacuating the Turner Center, and here my children were there with their children. We had sent them from us, thinking that if anything, at the older house, they would be safer at a newer facility. And I remember through her radio hearing one of our public safety folks or sheriff staff members saying, we're, we're losing the roof, we're losing the roof. And I could hear the tumult in the background and I could hear there were some people screaming 
And at that moment, she just kind of looked over at me, holding the radio, just frozen. In my mind, I'm trying to rationalize. It's probably okay. It's probably okay. I'm Matt Holloman. I'm the Public Information Coordinator for DeSoto County. Amazingly, no one was injured at the Turner Center. But out of the 12,000 homes there, some 10,000 were damaged. At one point, um, half of our population was displaced from their homes, either because you know, water had come in and they had to clean it out before they could move back in or because the roof was off and all their property was destroyed. Idyllic downtown Arcadia, famous for antiquing, sustained heavy damage. The popular Paradise restaurant leveled. The walls are in shambles, the roof is gone. It looks almost like an outdoor picnic area with debris all around it. I mean, the tables are still there, um, but it's a total wreck. And the fish tank is still on the counter, full of water with half a dozen or more fish swimming in it. And you wonder, what is it about these things that you know, spare some locations and devastates others? The scars have healed in the five years since Charlie. The Turner Center has been rebuilt, complete with a new emergency operations center on the adjoining property. Low-income housing has replaced some mobile homes, and the downtown has once again re-emerged as the premier spot for antiquing. We couldn't see it at the moment, and there were months on end where I think a lot of people who've lived here their whole life thought, DeSoto County's never gonna be the same again, but I think we can sit here today and say we're not the same, but we're better. And better prepared. Hurricane Charlie put people in this part of Florida in the mindset that just because we don't live on the coast does not mean we're guaranteed a pass on this one. The question remains. This storm appears to be moving more to the right. Can technology and forecasting now predict where another storm like Charlie will go? Much of Southwest Florida woke up on the morning of August 13th, 2004, expecting bad weather, but never a direct hit. Actually, I was, I was touching base with friends in Tampa because originally they had said the storm was probably going to go there. We were waiting for a storm that was supposed to go by us. Well, we heard a hurricane was going to hit Tampa. Uh, the track had it coming in north of us, uh, closer to Tampa Bay. And I think it's really important to remind people that Charlie wasn't a surprise. Charlie was coming. We were under a warning. The cone was pointed right at the west coast of Florida. The problem with Charlie, the perception was that everybody thought it was going to Tampa. The center of the cone had that little skinny black line pointing to Tampa, so everybody thought it's going to Tampa. Here. But it looks like the center of the storm is going to brush the coast closer to Tampa. And so again, this track, and we're not set in stone here by any means. We still have 24 hours to look at this thing. We do think that it's going to probably brush more, at least the center, up towards Tampa. One thing that really stands out that's changed dramatically for us is that since Charlie, we've dropped the little black line in the center of the cone of movement. Statistically, that little black line was the best predictor of where Charlie would go. But what that did was tell people that they didn't need to pay attention if they were off that line. And so what we noticed right away was once we got rid of the black line, we were able to say, this is the cone of movement. Anywhere in here, you need to pay attention. And I think Charlie is a direct directly responsible for that change that we've made. We dropped that line and now we focus on just the cone. Another forecasting change. Again, the storm surge with this, that's the rise in water as we get an approaching hurricane in all of the Gulf of Mexico coastal sections and the tidal water. The way Connected storm surge is predicted. The two hurricanes, Ike and Charlie, you know, were very devastating hurricanes, but the storm surge didn't match the category of the storm. Charlie was a Cat 4, but it had Cat 2 storm surge. Ike was a Cat 2, but it had Cat 4 storm surge. This year, for the first time, storm surge predictions will be determined independently. The forecast will come out separate for a storm surge prediction and separate for a wind and a event with the hurricane. And I think that's good. I think that's actually much better information for people. While changes have been made, the question remains, can a storm like Charlie happen again? I think that our ability to observe hurricanes has gotten better in the last five years, but I still believe another Charlie can happen. We're not making nearly the progress in technology on our ability to forecast hurricanes, especially hurricane intensity. That's our weak spot right now. Charlie was just supposed to be a one or a two. It blew up to a four. Nobody saw that in advance. 
that can, kind of surprise could happen once again. I believe that there is a portion of the community that is now proactive, realizes the hurricane's forecast can go wrong, there can be last minute surprises, there could be changes in intensity, and this proactive mindset might get some people moving earlier, making their game plan earlier, getting ready for hurricane season and the threat of a major hurricane a little sooner than they would have in the past. I think the one thing that Charlie definitely showed everybody was that we're still vulnerable for hurricane strikes. We always have been, but they've been very elusive over the last several decades. But once Charlie hit, everybody really got a good wake-up call that we it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And when it does, will we be ready? Check out this video if you can. Hopefully some of you can look at this. Uh, these are all the power trucks that have come to our area to help all of us with this uh, disaster. The day before Hurricane Charlie hit, Dawn and Sandy McGibbons welcomed us onto the porch of their historic Cracker Cottage, listening to music. They were optimistic the storm wouldn't be that bad. This is the seventh hurricane I've been through, and I never saw anything like this. Charlie destroyed their optimism. I mean, we didn't know if we were going to live. Their home, built in 1915, was gone, condemned by inspectors. That was tough, the day the house came down, um, because that's the day that those dreams are gone, and you got to start some new ones. They salvaged what they could. Anything that we could salvage, we put the word out in the community here. Do you need some original windows for your historic structure? Do you need uh, some doors, screened windows to the, the old wood, you know, screening with bronze? People took everything. And so um, a little bit of this house was all over the neighborhood, which is fabulous. I'm Don McGibbon. We lost our old home at this site in Hurricane Charlie. Now, five years later, the McGibbons sit on the porch of their new home, built to withstand hurricane force winds. This house is, um, it's steel rods all the way through inside concrete block. It's a flat roof and it's, uh, it's, it's basically a commercial roof on this house. Even our engineer uh, told us that if there's another hurricane that's coming here, this house is not going anywhere. Um, that's a cool thing. A lot of the changes have been in strengthening the homes. My name is Jim Evitz. I'm the building official and the director of building construction services for Charlotte County, Florida. Since Charlie hit, there have been two revisions to the Florida Building Code. Before 2004, hurricane shutters or glass wasn't required. The 2004 code, when it came in, that all changed. You either had to put hurricane glass or you had to put shutters on your house. That is the biggest change that they've had done. Another change, wind mitigation. Bracing gable ends on a home to keep the roof from flying off. In Florida, we build homes to hold them down, not to hold them up. Down here, we have to tie it to the ground to keep it from blowing away. And that goes for street signs and traffic lights, too. After uh, Charlie and subsequent storms, we took a real close look at our sign structures, and we realized that we could uh, use more steel to have a little bit more strength with our signs. The Florida Department of Transportation is putting traffic signals on mast arms. It's galvanized steel, very, very strong and certainly can withstand greater velocities of wind. This morning is extremely difficult to drive uh, with all the debris and the power lines and the uh, stop signs and, and the trees in the road. Keep in mind that most intersections, the lights are black right now. And certainly after Charlie, we learned that having generators in stock is gonna be very, very important. We could put a lot of traffic signals back into operation quickly, and certainly from a safety perspective, that was just paramount to us. Paramount to Florida Power and Light, getting people's electricity restored. Basically, here in Punta Gorda and around the hospital, the electrical system had to be rebuilt. More than 800,000 FP&L customers lost power, and there was a force of 10,000 working to restore it. It's amazing. I mean, you look around you. I see trucks from all over the place, Texas, everywhere that have come to help. Since Charlie, the agency has spent millions upgrading electrical poles. Every pole will have an inspection, and it will determine if that pole can withstand a certain rigor against the winds. And if it can't withstand, it's going to be replaced. While FPNL has strengthened the infrastructure around hospitals throughout the state, it has also upgraded its systems along major roadways. We've strengthened the infrastructure around a lot of the critical intersections throughout the state and a lot of the critical highways so that traffic can get moving and so that life can get back to normal as soon as possible. We were asked 
in the days after Charlie, when the devastation was pretty much uh, complete here in the Punta Gorda community, how long is it going to be? So, is life back to normal? As Hurricane Charlie made its way up the Lee Island coast, the barrier islands were first to take a hit. How about that? You can actually see inside this room, you can see a lone lamp standing there. While most of the structures on these islands have been rebuilt, scars from Hurricane Charlie still exist. On Sanibel Island, where the canopies on Periwinkle were destroyed. It's really kind of sad to say, but the island's landscape has totally changed thanks to this hurricane. To Pine Island, where you can still see trees snapped in half. Claimed that this was all Melaleuca trees, and they were all a good 25, 30 feet high. Every single trailer has damage to a certain degree. We first met Joe Tulinowski a few days after Hurricane Charlie hit. I've lived here since 1990. This, is, this has been my home. Like I said, I, I work here, I live here. This is, this is my whole world right now, and my whole world <laughs> is you might as well put it in a garbage bag because that's about all it's worth right now. He took us on a tour of the devastation then and now. Where you see these empty lots, there was a trailer there. Driving further, the signs of Charlie are even more evident. All this, this is all from the center of the park. In these piles of debris left over from the storm. <laughs> just can't, I just can't believe that it's it's been five years already. It just seems now that we're talking about it, it seems like it was yesterday. You know, I got, I got little goosebumps on me from actually admitting that I was scared. You know, I'm not afraid of too many things in the world, but Joe was making his peace that day. I, I thought that it might, we might have overstayed our welcome. You know, I thought that this might be it. Joe rode out the storm, hunkered down in a bathroom with his wife and dog with only a mattress for protection. The winds were so fast that it was sucking all the water out of the toilets, out of the drains, out of the sinks, the tub. And it sounded just like a train. It was like And it just get, get louder and louder. We were all pretty well shaken. We were, there was a lot of crying going on. Didn't know what we were gonna do. We had no electricity, no water. So Joe went through the park, gathering gas grills and any food he could find. I took a, a four foot section of fence and I spray painted on it, we have food. And everybody that wanted to eat, all they had to do was pull into the parking lot and we give them a hot meal and a bottle of water. What we need is we need some blankets, we need first aid kits. <laughs> I survived. <laughs> it was hard, but I survived. While Hurricane Charlie's wrath lasted only hours, it shattered what took most a lifetime to build. They have a golf course out there and it's absolutely flooded. The popular South Seas Island Resort on Captiva was devastated. The most destruction that we've witnessed so far on the northern tip of Captiva Island. Between the wind and the water, Charlie had no mercy. We actually had to dredge the marina because there was sand from the Gulf side in the marina. But five years and $140 million later, the scars have disappeared. The intention was to make sure that uh, it was rebuilt, but at the same time, nature stayed in the forefront. So uh, everything right now is fully back in order as if a storm never moved through here. At the historic Tarpon Lodge, the only remnants of Charlie are these tiny holes in the wood floor drilled to let the water drain out. There was flood damage from the rising tide, there was flood damage from all the rain that came down through the ceilings. And, uh, and those were the bulk of the real, real problems with the building. I'm Robert Wells, uh, manager of the Tarpon Lodge out here in Pineland, Florida. The history was uh, dating all the way back to 1926, and the, the old building had ridden out a lot of storms. Uh, for us, it was you know, in our best interest to try to rebuild it because it, we just felt like it, it had survived so long that it'd be tragic to see it you know, kind of go. Joe Waxler felt the same about his family's hardware store in Port Charlotte. Well, I got a call from my manager who said that the building is gone. His exact words were, there, there is no building. We drove down and uh, it was just demolished. There was nothing left. The entire hardware store, as we knew it, was gone. Um, so we had no choice but to 
either walk away or rebuild. And that was when we decided we would rebuild. 15 months and 14 days later. Does anybody want to go to a hardware no. store? We had people lined up around the block um, just to come in and say thank you for opening and we're really glad that you decided to, to open back up. I was just very grateful. I was very grateful that, that people really cared about that we had gone through all this. One building at a time, Southwest Florida began the rebuilding process. Pride. It, it's uh, when you're from here, and, and this is my home. Uh, I've lived here 45 years. Uh, you know, played little league baseball right down the river. It, it's a pride thing. I'm Wayne Saladin, director of emergency management for Charlotte County. It's just amazing to, to think that we rebuilt six schools, six fire stations, um, built all these new hotels, built uh, the new parking garage in Punta Gorda, uh, the Sunlaw Center, the Hospital Professional Center, uh, the public housing uh, at, at Cooper and, and Henry Street. It's just phenomenal, uh, the job that has been done by the community. The gaping wounds healed, the scars now disappearing. There's one question left to answer. And you look around and you think, why was I saved and he wasn't? In the five years since Hurricane Charlie hit Southwest Florida, the storm has been analyzed from every angle. But one thing we'll never know, how Hurricane Charlie chose what to destroy. It looks like a war zone through here. It looks like a war zone. And what to save. And you wonder what is it about these things that, you know, spare some locations and devastates others. The answer may lie in the images. The lone sign left standing. Glass angels unbroken on a shelf. An American flag that endured. Her husband's in Iraq and her flag stayed standing for him. From an elderly man too frail to carry water. I don't know how to explain it, but I just knew he couldn't carry it. And I just broke my heart and just um, really realized what's really going on to all of us. So. To a young child with wisdom beyond his years. I'm thinking that it's kind of good because because it's good is because we have no electricity and that means we can bond a little more. People can bond with their families mm -hmm. because they get, have to work together to survive. Hurricane Charlie's lesson to us is not in Mother Nature, but in human nature.